And I remember asking them, I was like, did you, you chose that job, right? And you can leave. And they were so offended by the idea that they had a choice. Like, and they, they eventually they admitted to me that they could leave and they would be fine because they have enough money and that they interviewed for that job and went for it. And they also could leave, but they, they weren't interested in choice. Like, I remember saying to them, like, I've never, this is a good friend of mine. I remember saying to them, like, why don't you want power in this situation? Like, why don't you want to be empowered? You're, you're like, I could observe in them that they wanted to be disempowered. They wanted to be powerless. They wanted to be a victim of circumstance. They didn't want to have a conversation about choices and the decisions they could make. They were not interested. And I was like, Jesus Christ, like, what a way to live. What a way to live, to not want to, you know, because objectively bad things happen to people. You know, traumas, they go through things which were nothing of their doing. They weren't to blame. But it doesn't mean, right, that we can't do something about it. Those are very two different things. Like, But you have to want it. Some people don't. So I think what you'll do is you'll be able to, people come to you and they'll say, Stephen, I need help or this and that. But you'll be able to see who genuinely really wants to move forward, who just wants to just tell you about it. How do you, how would you be able to identify the difference? So people who are, they call, it's called being identity. I, and I used this word before, but more in a clinical, not in a clinical, but more in the, the way that I've learned it through, through training and my the research. I also have a master's in forensic, master's in forensic psychology. When someone is identity, um, they use repeated, you'll hear them say, I, 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 I a lot. You can even see this in an email. Um, people who are identity tend to be highly depressed have a lot of anxiety. They're very self-focused. When They're very emotional based. So you can spot these individuals. Now, look, we all visit identity land from time to time. Like I may go through something difficult and have a moment in this identity space, but then I'm like, okay, I have to recover. But some people stay in this space. It's like their predominant disposition. So repeated use of I this, I that, I feel, I want, I went through. That's one red flag. The other thing is they're very emotional. Uh, you'll see they're linked. there's links to depression. They're typically depressed, but they stay in this space. The other thing is people like this who complain a lot. Do you know that when you relive a trauma or you complain or you have drama, like you get those, you get those cortisol hits. You get also adrenaline hits. Adrenaline hits. You, you get F3. It's your fight, flight, freeze response. We, we peak. And some people get addicted to that peak. I'm addicted to the trauma. I'm addicted to feeling that. It's like the, last week I was racing a car. I was at Porsche and I was racing cars for fun. And uh, when you're in the car, you're in the present, right? I'm like, shh, look, trying to not to hit the cones, doing whatever. I'm there. I'm in the moment. But like my adrenaline's going up. I'm peaking. I've got my F3s on fire. And I'm, but I'm focused. It feels, I feel alive. So for some people, when they get into this state, when they relive this stuff and they have these spikes or you see them very high conflict driven or high drama driven, they get these spikes. And it's when they feel in the moment, they feel alive and that you become addicted to it. It also becomes a habit. I was thinking then about the, this idea of identity and what, what identity also sometimes seems to give people is it gives them a community and it makes, gives them a sense of belonging and it gives them purpose, which we're all searching for. Like if I'm a insert trauma, then I instantly have a community of people that, you know, will make me feel like I belong. And then that is something I don't want to give up. If I give up my trauma, I end up giving up my sense of purpose, um, my, my community, who I belong to, the way the world understands me. And, uh, and that's, oh, I guess another reason why it can be so sticky. Like our traumas can be so sticky because we, we, we build our whole, like our social circle around them. We go to events about it. We were in group, little social media groups about it. But I think today trauma has become like a badge of honor now. In fact, you hear people talking and it's like a competition about who has more trauma. <laughs> That's, is it not that? Who has, exp I have more trauma than you. No, I've had it harder than you. Like it's a, comp a competition of who's had it the hardest. And it's, it's become like this, this thing now to, that we put on a pedestal. I think it's just the new way to draw attention to ourselves and to make ourselves relevant. It's like ego and status. It and, is yeah. ego. It is status. And it's, 
it's interesting, the sense of belonging in group, out group, that's a whole other psychological thing. If I'm in a group, then I feel like I belong somewhere. It's like how, I'm taking it back to crime gangs, or why people join terrorist organizations. They join it because they want to be part of something. It's not because they're bad people. I want to feel like I'm part of a group. And so this makes me feel relevant, which is fine, but to a degree, you also have to have your, your sovereignty as a person. We want to be part of something because we don't want to be out there and alone out there. But you don't have to be alone out there. But we hitch ourselves to these narratives. And now my identity is I'm a survivor of this. I am someone who's experienced this. It's like, no, those are things that happened to me, but they are not who I am. I'm an evolving thing. I called my book Becoming Bulletproof because I am always becoming. I'm becoming more. I'm evolving. I, we don't stop. I, I don't want to stop. I'm never going to get to a point where I know everything. Every day I learn something. What was the most interesting day of your career? When I say interesting, the day that you think about and go, Jesus, that was like awesome. Or that was from a movie. So I have, I can give you a story, which I don't think I've shared. So I, because I didn't look like an agent, I would get pulled in for a lot of undercover stuff, which I loved. It was fun, scary, but because I never got pegged for an agent, like I always felt super safe. So I did this one thing where it was another undercover case where they came to me and we were working with NYPD. It wasn't my case, but they wanted me, there was this organized crime ring. I think they were Albanian and they were selling passports, original passports and birth certificates to terrorists. This is, and so they're selling it to them to help them come into the U.S. and to other, other people who are bad actors. So we, they, the agencies get wind of this and they want to get this, these, these guys, this guy specifically with this organized crime ring. They're trying to figure out how to get in because they were so good at what they did, like you couldn't get them. So they wanted me to go in undercover and pretend to be someone who needed paperwork. So they're trying to figure out how do we do it. So the, the idea we came up with was I would be someone who had been sex trafficked from an Eastern Bloc country because I, I, I can pass for it. So um, I started talking on the phone. I was introduced him through another undercover and talking to him on the phone and I had to develop an Eastern Bloc accent. I need my papers. They brought me here from, you know, my country. Uh, because when they sex traffic people in, the first thing they do when they lure you in is they'll take your paperwork from you. And they and you can't even get a cell phone here in the U.S. without paperwork. So they take your stuff and then they put you either to do sex traffic, you know, sex work or work in strip clubs or, or both um, till you pay off your debt for them bringing you to America. So I pretended to be one of those. So I, you know, under that premise, I have no paperwork, so I can't get an apartment. I can't get anything. I'm at the mercy of these traffickers, which until I pay my my dues, which you never do, by the way. They keep you locked in. And then they make them afraid and they tell them if you say anything, they're going to deport you back, which actually is not true. However, so I take on this role. I start talking to this guy. I need papers. I please. They take my papers. 